Su Subcommittee on Investigations Oversight will come to order. Good morning. Welcome to today's hearing titled The Endangered Species Act, Reviewing the Nexus of Science and Policy. The Endangered Species Act, ESA, is one of the most influential and far-reaching environmental laws this nation has ever passed. Since its passage in 1974, it has been the subject of considerable debate, not only about its impact on our nation's economy, but also about its ultimate effectiveness. Everyone wants to save species from extinction, but honest people can have an honest debate about the most efficient and effective way to do so. In terms of effectiveness, I believe it would be hard to argue that the law has been anything but an abject failure. Of the roughly 2,000 species listed as endangered or threatened, only about 1% have actually recovered. As a tool for advancing other special interest policy goals, it has certainly been influ very influential. And I'm sure that the acts that, that was not the Act's original intent. Today's hearing will explore how the science is used to inform policy decisions under ESA. The written testimonies provided by our witnesses highlight major flaws in the basic construct and implementation of the Act. Landowners are penalized rather than rewarded for protecting habitat and reporting populations. Dr. Wilkins writes that only with the guarantee of anonymity will most landowners consent to having their property surveyed for the existence of a particular species. As one example, his scientists found 28 more locations where the dunes sagebrush lizard was found compared to only three previously known locations. This data was only captured after landowners viewed Texas A&M researchers as something other than a threat to their property rights. Professor Adler's testimony highlights many other weaknesses in how the act threatens science and policy. And Mr. Vincent Lang will provide a state's perspective on ESA. Recent events at the Department of Interior have also attracted this subcommittee's attention. On September 16, 2011, U.S. District Court Judge Oliver Wanger of California sharply criticized the work and testimony concerning the Delta smelt biological opinion by two federal scientists, one from the Fish and Wildlife Service and one from the Bureau of Reclamation. Com commenting on the Fish and Wildlife Service scientist, Judge Wanger stated, quote, I found her testimony to be that of a zealot, unquote. In further comments about the Bureau of Reclamation scientists, he stated, quote, and I'm going to make a very clear and explicit record to support that finding of agency bad faith because, candidly, the only inference that the court can draw is that this is an attempt to mislead and, dece and deceive the court into accepting what is not only the best science, it's not science, unquote. I'm also concerned about the flood of ESA petitions and the related lit litigation that could potentially challenge the quality of the service's work. I find it revealing that some of the same entities that have brought lawsuits over hundreds of species brag in their annual reports about the money that they make from filing environmental lawsuits against federal agencies. In its 2010 annual report, Wild Earth Guardians states that 10 percent of their income came from litigation settlements and that they depend upon this income to, quote, survive and thrive, unquote. I note that this so-called income is at taxpayers' expense. Maybe supporting env environmental trial lawyers is part of the President's job plan, but I doubt that the American people would agree that these are green jobs. Two recent court settlements require over 600 species to be jammed through the Fish and Wildlife Service listing process, regardless of other agency priorities. I have serious concerns about whether these listings will be made based upon science, as they should be, are on legal expedience. In a time of record unemployment, the administration continues to choose regulations over jobs. While I, ag I agree an appropriate balance can be met, constituents in my district need jobs, not red tape. 
We don't live in a vacuum, and neither should our environmental laws. Many of the witnesses before us today have identified serious weaknesses with ESA, as well as practical solutions that can bring about real conservation. It is a time for, it is past time actually, for an overhaul of the Endangered Species Act. You'll find in front of you packets containing our witnesses, witness panel's written testimony, biographies, and truth and testimony disclosures. I recognize myself now for an op opening statement. Excuse me. Uh, I recognize ranking member from Maryland, my friend, Ms. Edwards, for her opening statement. I just did mine. Ms. <laughs> Edwards, you were recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding the hearing and our witnesses for being here today. And uh, pardon my uh, laryngitis. It will hurt you more to listen to it than it does me to talk. Um, at the heart of this hearing is really about scientific integrity and whether we plan to face the problems with science in the management of the Endangered Species Act. I want to begin by quoting one of our country's most famous conservationists, President Richard Nixon. And he said, and I quote, nothing is more priceless and more worthy of preservation than the rich array of animal life with which our country has been blessed. It is a many faceted treasure of value to scholars, scientists, and nature lovers alike and it forms a vital part of the heritage we all share as Americans. And I do share that sentiment. I just want to remind everyone that President Nixon said those words on the occasion of signing into law the Endangered Species Act of 1973. Part of the reason I share that quote is because protecting wildlife and protecting nature from destruction used to be a bipartisan cause. But unfortunately, my Republican colleagues no longer see eye to eye with their party's former president. And let's make no mistake about it, the Endangered Species Act, when it's allowed to work, protects wildlife from utter destruction. But since 1973, protection of wildlife has increasingly become associated with the, quote, liberal cause. And what's most disturbing about this is that since 1973, we've learned so much about the benefits of biodiversity and the value of healthy ecosystems um, and the value that that provides to people. And as I look in this room, uh, we do see the portrait of my friend, uh, former chairman of um, here, Sherry Bullard, who was a Republican. He was a proud environmentalist. I was a colleague of his on the board of the League of Conservation Voters. And it really saddens me that he may have been one of the last of his kind in the Republican Party. The focus of today's hearing seems to be on attacking the integrity of agency scientists with little help from former U.S. District Court Judge Oliver Wanger's um, inflammatory opinion in the Delta Smelt case from last month. In the wake of that widely reported decision, the judge appears to have backtracked on his over-the-top comments. And I think that his extreme language was misguided and efforts to attack the credibility of agency scientists also misguided. The evidence of the past decade has shown that the real scientific integrity at issue in our federal agencies generally and the Fish and Wildlife Service specifically has been political meddling with the agency science. I hope our group of witnesses can speak to that problem. And I want to thank you, Chairman Brown, for calling such a superb panel for that purpose. Present on today's panel, you also have a former Bush Administration Assistant Secretary, Craig Manson who was mentioned 155 times in a 2008 investigative report by the Department of Interior Inspector General. The then Interior Inspector General, Earl Devaney, was looking into allegations of misconduct by Mr. Manson's deputy, Julie McDonald. To quote just a small portion of the Inspector General's memorandum, he noted, and I quote, and it's important for the record, Quote, McDonald's zeal to advance her agenda has caused considerable harm to the integrity of the ESA program and to the morale and reputation of fish and wildlife, as well as potential harm to individual species. Her heavy handedness, handedness has cast doubt on nearly every ESA decision issued during her tenure. Of the 20 decisions we reviewed, her influence potentially jeopardized 13 ESA decisions. McDonald conduct, McDonald's conduct was backed by the seemingly blind support of former Assistant Secretary for Fish and Wildlife and Parks, Judge Craig Manson. Judge Manson so thoroughly supported McDonald that even 
when a known error in a Federal Register notice, which was caused by McDonald's calculations, was brought to Manson's attention, he directed that notice to be published regardless of the error. If I'm not mistaken, Mr. Chairman, I believe that the Fish and Wildlife witness we have today here, Craig Frazier, was the very person who brought the aforementioned error to the Federal Register notice to Mr. Manson's attention. And how, he was, how was he rewarded for trying to correct the error? Mr. Manson transferred him out of the agency. Thankfully, one of Mr. Manson's successors had the good sense to rectify this abusive conduct with respect to Mr. Frazier, a dedicated public servant who just wanted to get the correct information published and not simply spit out whatever was politically expedient. He is back at the department, and I'm happy to see him here today before us in an official capacity, and I look forward to his uh, very candid testimony today. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. If there are members who wish to submit a, additional opening statements, your statements will be added to the record at this point. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panel of witnesses. Gary Frazier, Assistant Director, Endangered Species, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Professor Jonathan Adler of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. The Honorable Craig Manson, General Counsel, Westlands Water District. Douglas Vincent Lang, Special Assistant, Alaska Department of Game and Fish. Dr. Neil Wilkins, Director of Texas and A&M Institute of Renewal, Renewable Natural Resources and Dr. Francesca T. Is it Griffo? Griffo, okay. Union of Concerned Scientists. As our witnesses should know, spoken testimony is limited to five minutes each, after which the members of the committee will have five minutes each to ask questions. Your written testimony will be included in the record of the hearing. It is the practice of the Subcommittee on Investigations and Oversight to receive testimony under oath do any of you have an objection of taking an oath? Everybody sits there staring at me. I, I like to see their heads either move from side to side or something. So uh, everybody, no one uh, has an objection to taking an oath. Is that correct? Okay. Let the reflect record reflect that all witnesses are, reflect, are willing to take an oath as reflected by their shaking their head from side to side. You also may be represented by counsel. Do any of you have counsel with you here today? Again, okay. <laughs> Judge Madison, do you have a counsel? Okay, very good, thank you. <laughs> Let the record reflect that none of the witnesses have counsel. If all of you would please now stand and raise your right hand. Just Manson, you don't have to do that. <laughs> um, please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to affirm to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that all of the witnesses participating have taken the oath. I now recognize our first witness, Mr. Frazier. You have five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Edwards, and members of the subcommittee. I am Gary Fraser, Assistant Director for the Endangered Species Program within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I appreciate this opportunity to discuss how the service carries out its duties related to listing, delisting, consultation, and recovery of species under the Endangered Species Act. This job has never been easy, and it grows more difficult every day. We're facing an extinction crisis. The nature of this work often results in strongly held views on all sides and frequent challenges to our decisions. In the face of all that, we believe that the service does an excellent job of making decisions that are scientifically sound, legally correct, transparent, and capable of withstanding challenge. The ESA provides a critical safety net for America's native fish, wildlife, and plants, and we know it can deliver remarkable successes. Since Congress passed this landmark conservation law in 1973, the ESA has prevented, the ex the ex prevented the extinction of hundreds of imperiled species across the nation and promoted the recovery of many others. Our nation's rich diversity of fish, wildlife, and plants symbolizes America's wealth and promise. The ESA represents a firm commitment to protect and preserve our natural heritage out of a deeply held understanding of the direct link between the health of our ecosystems, the services they provide, and our own well-being. 
The ESA directs that determinations on whether to list any species as endangered or threatened must be made solely on the basis of the best scientific and commercial data available. The term best scientific and commercial data, commercial data available means those data that are available at the time the service makes a listing determination. And the Act also establishes the schedule under which the service must make those determinations. We do not have the luxury of waiting for all the information we might want. Rather, we have to make timely decisions based on the information that is available. A full description of the procedures used for identifying candidate species, responding to petitions to list, and make listing and delisting decisions is provided in my written statement. The workload associated with carrying out our listing activities has for many years exceeded the resources available to the service. Therefore, a substantial backlog of listing actions has accumulated. The service recently developed a six-year work plan for the listing program through mediated settlement agreements with two of the service's most frequent plaintiffs. The service will systematically review and address the needs of more than 250 species that are currently candidates for protection under the ESA to determine if they should be listed as threatened or endangered species. The service will make listing determinations for each species, carefully reviewing scientific information and public comments before deciding whether listing is still warranted, and if so, whether to designate the species as threatened or endangered. Each and every listing proposal will be subject to independent peer review and public comment. Service decisions under the Endangered Species Act are sometimes controversial, and there have been cases in the recent past where the scientific underpinning of the service's decisions has been subject to high-level independent scientific review. My written statement describes several such reviews, but I will note one in particular. In 2008, the service issued a Jeopardy biological opinion to the Bureau of Reclamation regarding the continued long-term operation of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project and included a reasonable and prudent alternative to protect Delta smelt in their habitat. The scientific information that the service used in the 2008 Central Valley Project opinion has now been reviewed by five separate independent peer review processes, including a 2010 review by a National Research Council panel. While these reviews identified elements of the opinion that might have been handled differently or justified more thoroughly, they all largely affirmed that the service used the best available scientific information and applied that information in a conceptually sound and scientifically justified manner. The science underlying the service's Central Valley Project opinion is also the subject of ongoing litigation. With regard to recent comments made by former U.S. District Judge Oliver Wanger, we fully believe that, uh, we firmly believe that the wise decisions about the future of the Bay Delta must be guided by our best available science. The department stands behind the consistent and thorough work that our scientists from the service and the Bureau of Reclamation have done on the Bay Delta over many years. We also believe that when questions arise regarding the integrity of scientific work, it is important to resolve them swiftly, independently, and decisively. We disagree with Judge Wanger's comments last month, and we recognize and appreciate his effort to clarify those comments before his retirement. Still, we believe it important that we follow the department's standard procedures for reviewing, reviewing questions of scientific integrity so that we can resolve them definitively and provide the due process that our affected scientists deserve. Therefore, the department has instructed the scientific integrity officers of the service and the Bureau of Reclamation to retain independent experts to evaluate the allegations made by Judge Wanger. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I would like to emphasize the importance the service places upon having a science-driven, transparent decision-making process in which the affected public can participate effectively. Thank you for your interest in endangered species conservation and ESA implementation and for the opportunity to testify. I would be happy to answer any questions that you and the other members of the subcommittee might have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frazier, and I appreciate your staying with you in your five minutes. Uh, Judge Manson, I now recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Congresswoman Edwards, members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear here before you today on this most important subject. I will um, note that most of my biography is in my written statement. I'd like to add to that, however, that I grew up in a community of scientists, uh, and I have the greatest respect for scientists. I took pride in the work of the people the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service, whom I oversaw during my tenure as Assistant Secretary. I'm also pleased that, jo that Professor Jonathan Adler is here uh, because he is one of the most 
cogent and organized voices on issues of science and policy in academia today. So if you don't want to believe me, believe him, because he, as, as I note in my written testimony, uh, my writings, which are meager compared to his, and my testimony has been criticized or critiqued in hundreds of law review and scholarly articles, and his has been largely praised. So please pay attention to his testimony. Now the issue of science and, and policy in the ESA, I compare in my written testimony to the push me pull you. That was the fictional species that Dr. Doolittle discovered in uh, the first book written about Dr. Doolittle. It's described as having no tail but two heads that pulled in opposite directions. And sometimes that's the way science and policy are with respect to the ESA. I want to summarize my written testimony in about five points, but I'll depart from those uh, points to comment since I was named specifically in Congresswoman Edwards' opening statement to address that, uh, that issue as a matter of fact. I found it curious that the Inspector General of the Department of the Interior took two years after I had left the department to come ask me anything about any of those cases. I found it interesting that during the time that any, any of these things were happening, no one approached me and, and asked me any questions about any of those things. And so it made me suspect of their motives and, and qu calls into question, in my mind, at least their integrity. Now, I want to talk about the incident with Gary Frazier. Gary was the one who brought to my attention a flaw in a rule that we were issuing, and I appreciated that very much. The problem was one of litigation. I was faced with one of two choices, either not publish the rule and be found in contempt of a federal court, or publish the rule with the inaccurate information and then republish an amended rule, which is what we did. We published an amended rule with the correct information, so we made the deadline imposed by the federal judge, were not held in contempt, and got the accurate information out there in any event. But let me go back to my five points. First, there are distinct roles for science and policy in the ESA. And some scientists, lawyers, and policymakers misunderstand the relationship between policy and science in ESA decision making. <laughs> We make not scientific decisions, but science-informed decisions in the ESA, and our science must be of the highest quality in order to do that. My second point is that we have to stop pretending that the ESA is not a politicized statute. It is. If, this, if it were not, this committee would not be holding this hearing. It obviously is because it deals with the economics and the property rights of individuals uh, uh, and these are constitutional rights protected by our great charter. The third point I want to make is that there has to be some accountability for everyone involved in the system, from uh, po political appointees through scientists. And it's the job of the, of the executive branch to oversee the work of its employees, and that is what happens in most cases that some have misconstrued as political interference. Finally, the ESA decision context presents a poor fit between science and policy, according to Professor J.B. Rule. And one reason for that is the imposition of the regulatory scheme immediately upon the making of a, a scientific finding. In my written testimony, I describe how that might be fixed, and I'd be glad to answer questions about that or any other matter that comes before the committee while I'm here today. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I now recognize our next witness, uh, Mr. Vincent Lang, for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Ms. Edwards, committee members. Thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. Species in Alaska have increasingly become targeted for listing based solely on speculated risks such as climate change, despite their currently healthy status. This is best exemplified by the decision of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list polar bears as threatened species worldwide. 
Polar bears were listed based on models that hypothesized that climate change will result in a decline of sea ice habitats and on speculation that lost sea ice habitat will threaten currently healthy populations with extinction by mid-century. This listing was made despite the fact that the worldwide polar bear population remains at all-time record numbers. Furthermore, many underlying critical assumptions and hypotheses in the models went untested. Alaska disagrees that the act should be used as a precautionary tool to list currently healthy species based solely on model results of future threats such as climate change. The state is challenging this listing and the precedent it is setting. The National Marine Fisheries Service recently proposed to list ring seals, which number between three to seven million based on the same modeling approach, an action we are also opposing. Ultimately, what species could not be listed? It is apparent to us that the act is being used by federal agencies to gain control over landscapes and seascapes rather than to arrest species extinction. We do not believe Congress intended the act to be used in this manner, nor do we believe Congress intended the act to be used by federal agencies to wrest control of currently healthy populations from state management authority. Another issue is a threshold question regarding when it is necessary to list a species. In the past, species were listed based on relatively high risk of extinction within the near-term future. Recently, however, federal agencies have begun extending the period of foreseeable future into the more distant future, yet retaining low risk of extinction probability. This raises the question as to whether species that have low risk of extinction within the immediate future should be precautionarily listed. It also raises the question as to how far into the future can population trends be reasonably predicted. Finally, what is a reasonable level of extinction risk? We are concerned with how recovery goals are being established and used in Section 7 consultations also. For example, the recovery goal for delisting stellar sea lions in the western Alaska numbers over 100,000 animals. This is far higher than ne simply needed to remove the risk of extinction in our opinion. However, despite the fact that the population currently is numbering over 73,000 animals and growing overall across its range, the National Marine Fisheries Service has released a new biological opinion that found that fishing in some areas of the western Aleutians is jeopardizing the stock and adversely modifying its habitat and has adopted new closures and restrictions to fishing. These closures are economically devastating to local economies and raise environmental justice concerns. The state raised serious questions regarding the foundational science associated with this decision. The National Marine Fisheries Service did not conduct an independent review of their work, which would have highlighted the analytical shortcomings the state identified. In fact, a subsequent independent analysis substantiated many of the scientific concerns identified by the states and affected users. This raises a question as to whether recovery goals are being set too high. Should recovery goals reflect the number required to remove the risk of extinction or to a number higher that represents some level of historical abundance? Should recovery plans contain non-population objectives that must be achieved, for example, greenhouse gas emission targets? Another concern is the matter in which the two services identify subspecies or distinct population segments for listing under the Endangered Species Act. In 1973, Congress had no way to predict the genome of several plants and animals could actually be mapped. We know now enough about genetics to de detect even the most subtle differences, not just between species, but individuals within given species. Couple this knowledge with the ability to use the Endangered Species Act to list subspecies and distinct population segments, and every local population with slight geographic or genetic differences or population at the edge of species range become candidates for ESA listings, regardless of their overall abundance of the species. Alaska is also concerned with how critical habitat is being designated. Following its decision to list the polar bear as a threatened species, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service designated a vast area of Alaska and its offshore areas as critical habitat. The area designated is the largest ever designated for a species and encompasses an area larger than the size of California. The designated habitat includes any place a polar bear might roam during its life. This is a dramatic deviation from previous critical habitat designations where specific areas of critical importance were only designated. The state and others are challenging this designation as well as what we believed were serious underestimation of the economic impacts associated with this designation. Finally, when Congress, when passing the act, Congress clearly identified a unique role for states in all Endangered Species Act decisions. This role is contained in Section 4I of the act. This section clearly grants states a place at the table in all ESA decisions, including the application of science in these decisions. Unfortunately, states are not be given equal deference 
on science during the implementation of the Act. Instead, the services are increasingly using their deference to discount valid questions raised by states on federal interpretation of science. They are also using their deference as a basis for the defense of flawed science. We believe states should have equal deference on science in all ESA decisions. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Vincent Lang. I appreciate your testimony. I love your state, too. Uh, I've had the opportunity to visit there and hunt, hunted uh, brown bear and sheep and moose and caribou. That's a wonderful, wonderful place. I now recognize our next witness, Dr. Wilkins. You recognize for five minutes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for putting attention to this important issue. I work as a professor of wildlife science at Texas A&M University, where I also direct two research institutes that are part of AgriLife Research and Extension, part of our land-grant university system. I've spent much of the last 20 years dealing with endangered species science and endangered species conservation. Science and its application to conservation has progressed substantially to, since the Endangered Species Act first passed, which was in the Nixon administration, but the act has not had any substantial change since the Reagan administration. Around that time, the service began using science-specific information to guide the process for considering candidates to the endangered species list, but this approach was never added to the law. Therefore, the service is still required to review every new listing petition within 12 months, regardless of what we really know about the species. The result is the well-known backlog of pending decisions, litigation, and court orders. The service has made some strides in implementing ESA through development of habitat conservation plans, mitigation banking, safe harbors, and some newer market-based incentives like recovery credit systems. These innovations have helped advance the science for implementing the Act, but these are not enough. There are still significant barriers to the use of reliable science in guiding endangered species policy and decision making. By not deferring to states' efforts, we miss some important opportunities for more effective conservation actions than the one-size-fits-all protections under ESA. The case of the dune sagebrush lizard provides some good lessons. In December of 2010, the service released a proposal to list this species, which had previously been a candidate for listing starting in 1982. The lizard's listing proposal caught many off guard and created a lot of attention as the listing threatened to impact oil and gas development in the Permian Basin of West Texas. Our research group at Texas A&M quickly fielded a large team that in one month collected more information on the species range in Texas than had been collected in the previous 40 years. Such swings in attention and activity occur when the program is driven by lawsuits. On a high note, the Endangered Species Task Force in Texas a group that was recently put together by our state legislature, quickly developed a conservation plan for the lizard that is now in the Federal Register for review. This shows that some of the options for deferring ESA recovery actions to the states can make some sense. The golden-cheeked warbler is another good example of how ESA policy can drift unmoored from science. This songbird was believed to number less than 32,000 birds when it was listed as endangered in 1992. Our recent surveys across private ranch lands in 35 counties in Texas demonstrated that there were likely greater than 200,000 males of this species in its breeding range. This new information differs widely with what is currently in the official record, so there is some real resistance to making decisions on this new information as it could pose a risk for a lawsuit. The deadline-driven process often requires the service to use some unreliable information that is presented in a petition as best available science. And once that information is on the official record, it is tough to counter when scientists finally generate better information on the species. As we have seen in the case of Rocky Mountain wolves and other species, it is possible to recover species biologically and fail to acknowledge this bureaucratically because the law is in the way. There are at least four things we can do about this. Number one, we need to require a standardized, independent, peer review of scientific information used in the listing process. Current peer reviews are inconsistent and really not independent. With adequate peer review, we might avoid locking in on whatever information is available at the time as persistent truth, regardless of its quality or subsequent discoveries. 
Second, we can clear the backlog of listing petitions by authorizing the ESA listing process to work according to a science-based priority system instead of a 12-month deadline. 12-month deadline means the service will often accept speculation and other unreliable information as best science. A science-based priority system would return these decisions to field science and an open public process. As a third recommendation, we can separate the listing and recovery functions of the ESA by delegating recovery planning to the states as an option. Finally, can incentivize species recovery by linking the delisting process to reaching recovery goals. Recovery goals mean something and they ought to be acted upon. This remains an important topic and deserves some action. I thank you again for giving it your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wilkins. Um, as a Georgia Bulldog, I want to welcome you and Texas A&M to the SEC. <laughs> we, we, we hope to do well in the SEC, well, sir. Welcome. <laughs> Join the toughest football league in the, in the country. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Adler, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Congresswoman Edwards, and members of the subcommittee for the invitation to testify this morning regarding the nexus of science and policy under the Endangered Species Act. I've submitted a longer written statement for the record, and I want to stress two key points in my oral, oral remarks. First, it is important to distinguish between questions of science and questions of policy. And second, the act itself puts undue pressure on scientific inquiry. And if we're concerned about scientific integrity, in conservation decision making. We have to do something about the structure of the act and the pressures it puts upon scientific decision making. As to the first point, the political debate over the use of science under the Endangered Species Act tends to obscure the dividing line between science and policy, and as a consequence, undermines the development of more effective and equitable conservation strategies. Species conservation efforts are heavily dependent upon science. Biological research is necessary to inform species conservation decisions. But species conservation is not, and indeed cannot be, a purely scientific exercise. Whether a given species is at risk of extinction may be a scientific question, but what to do about it is not. The likelihood that habitat loss or the introduction of an invasive species will compromise a species chance of survival in the wild is a question that can be answered by science. On the other hand, how we should interpret incomplete or ambiguous data, what conservation measures to adopt to address threats to a given species, and at what cost, are policy questions. Science can indeed must inform all such inquiries, but science alone does not tell us what to do, and we don't serve the, the goals of species conservation when we pretend otherwise. Debates over conservation policy are often dressed up as debates over conservation science, and this hampers our ability to reach policy consensus and obscures what's really at stake. Where science is used, it is important to ferret out instances of real scientific misconduct and science politicization. Agency personnel and others should not be permitted to distort or misrepresent scientific findings, whatever the purpose. And when true science abuse occurs, it should be exposed and corrected, and those responsible should be disciplined. But it is also important to understand that not all disputes over science-related questions are truly disputes about science. And further, it's important to understand how the structure of the act itself contributes to the politicization and manipulation of science and how it creates incentives that compromise the scientific integrity of conservation decisions. It's now widely recognized and well documented that the Endangered Species Act itself creates perverse incentives that discourage species conservation, particularly on private land. What is less well understood is that these same provisions in the act, the same regulatory structure, places pressure on science and can discourage this, the discovery and collection of needed scientific information about potentially imperiled species again, particularly on private land. Just as the threat of land use regulation discourages the creation or maintenance of species habitat, the threat of such regulation discourages private landowners from disclosing information and cooperating with scientific research on their land. Landowners are increasingly reluctant to allow biologists and other researchers onto their land to survey species populations and conduct other research out of fear of regulatory constraints that could follow the discovery of a rare animal or plant. Yet information about the location and status of species populations is essential to the development of effective species recovery plans. The lack of more complete data on endangered species and their habitat greatly complicates species conservation efforts. Yet the act itself compromises our ability to know which species are in most need of help and where they may be most in danger. And the act itself often causes us to know far less about a species than we should before adopting regulatory measures or other constraints on productive economic activity. 
And this is a particularly severe problem because we know that the vast majority of species that are listed rely upon private land for habitat. And so the act is discouraging our ability to know what species are on private land, what condition they're in. The act itself is tying one hand behind our back in dealing with the majority of species that we are concerned about. And we, this is particularly important because we have what economists would refer to as an information asymmetry. Private landowners are in a much better position to know what's on their land and what condition it is in than biologists at the Fish and Wildlife Service or at research universities. If they can't work together, and if the act discourages them from working together, we have a hard time from developing conservation plans and environmental strategies that will actually work. It is the structure of the act that does this, just as it is the structure of the act that makes scientific judgments such as the decision to list a species, extremely consequential. When you list a species, certain regulatory measures kick in automatically and can form the basis of private citizen suits to force additional regulatory controls. And as a consequence, warring factions devote substantial resources to influencing scientific outcomes. This makes science abuse and politicization all but inevitable. Safeguarding science requires statutory reforms that will insulate scientific judgments from policy decisions and lower the stakes of listing decisions. More broadly, we need to make saving endangered species more important than saving the Endangered Species Act as it is currently written. Thank you again for the opportunity to present my views on this important subject, and I'm well, willing to answer any questions this committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Adler. Dr. Griffo, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Edwards, and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to participate in this hearing. My name is Francesca Griffo, and I'm a senior scientist and director of the Scientific Integrity Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists, a leading science-based nonprofit working for a healthy environment and a safer world. I come here today with 30 years of training, research, teaching, and policy experience, a passion for the natural world, and a mother's concerns about her children's future. One of the great strengths of the Endangered Species Act is its foundation in robust scientific principles. Objective scientific information and methods should be used in protecting species. The habitat needs of endangered species should be scientifically well informed, and the standard of best available science must rely on impartial scientific experts. Actions have consequences with wide-ranging implications, and we need to understand that, and that means science. Making observations, asking questions, analyzing results. Unfortunately, under the previous administration, the science of the Endangered Species Act was attacked. It happened at every stage of the process, 90-day findings to listing to recovery plans to the designation of critical habitat and even delisting, affecting more than 80 species. One might say, so what, except that an emerging body of research is now uncovering a hugely important range of be benefits of biodiversity for human health. In a broad sense, most ecosystem services, such as water purification and food provision, have a direct or indirect impact on our health. But ecosystems also provide more specific benefits. Plants and bacteria are well-recognized key sources of new medicines, and other important links include benefits for mental health and the complex influence of the natural environment on the spread of infectious diseases. Many links between biodiversity and health remain unknown. But there is a growing body of evidence that disturbances to ecosystems may have large consequences for human well-being. Thus, protecting biodiversity, both the number of species and the structure of communities, helps minimize undesirable or expensive or unintended impacts on our health. Furthermore, three-quarters of Americans participate in active outdoor recreation each year and spend money, create jobs, and support the, local eco support the economies of local communities when they do. The number of New Englanders who participate in trail-based recreation annually is greater than the combined attendance for all 81 Boston Red Sox games, home games. And active outdoor recreation and the outdoor active recreation economy employs five times more Americans than Walmart, the world's largest private employer. The ESA works. Less than 1% of listed species have gone extinct since 1973, while 10% of candidate species still waiting to be listed are gone. In addition to the hundreds of species that the Act has protected from extinction, listing has contributed to population increases or the stabilization of populations for at least 35% of listed species, and perhaps significantly more, as well as the recovery of such signature species as the peregrine falcon. While complete recovery has been realized for just 2% of the species listed, given the precarious state of most species when listed, 
This represents significant progress. Arguably, the most notable success of the Endangered Species Act is that listed species improve in status through time. More species are downlisted than the converse. More species transition from stable to improving than the converse. The science advisor asked agencies to tackle the issue of scientific integrity, and the Department of the Interior was the first out of the box to do so. While they are well on their way to creating a culture of accountability and scientific integrity, we look forward to learning more about their ambitious plans for training, the progress of the scientific integrity officers, and their forthcoming revised peer review and communications policies. And we expect them to be good. Science cannot be a mask behind which decision makers can do anything that special interests or ideology might dictate. The rightful place for science is as the basis of broad, participatory, and transparent conversations about how to solve the challenges we face. It is not okay to say the science made me do it while changing the science to justify policy decisions. Thank you for your interest in endangered species conservation and for the opportunity to testify. I am happy to respond to questions you or other members of the committee may have. Thank you, Dr. Griffo, and I thank the panel for y'all's testimony. Reminding members that the committee rules limit questioning to five minutes. The chair at this point will open the round of questions. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes. Mr. Frazier, in your testimony, you state that the Joint Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service's policy on information standards under the Endangered Species Act issued in 1994 requires your biologists and managers to, quote, ensure that the information that we use is reliable and credible and represents the best data available, unquote. Do you believe the work a federal scientist on the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project Biological Opinion in California adhere to the standards outlined in this policy? And if so, how do you respond to a federal judge stating that the testimony of these two employees were so contradictory and inconsistent that it amounted to deliberate deception and bad faith on the part of the, on the, part of the Department of Interior? Mr. Chairman, we do believe that our biological opinion was based on the best available scientific information. As I stated in my opening statement, um, it's been through five separate independent um, peer reviews, one by um, a National Research Council panel. We disagree with Judge Wanger's um, characterizations, but we're taking it as um, a serious allegation and we're using our scientific integrity policy to thoroughly investigate that and determine whether there's any basis for, for his statements. We do note and appreciate that he um, sought to clarify those statements um, in a following um, hearing that he held uh, the week after. Okay, your testimony states the department is seeking independent experts to evaluate the allegations. Will these experts be independent of the service and the, and the Bureau of Reclamation, independent of the department, or independent of the administration? We have a, a, an existing contract to go to an outside party to enlist independent experts to be able to conduct this review, and they'll provide a report to the scientific integrity officers of the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Reclamation. How will you ensure that the experts have sufficient independent scientific expertise and investigative backgrounds? Through our our scientific integrity policy of the department lays out the process for conducting such reviews, um, and we will be we have developed a statement of work that lays out the, the qualifications and requirements of the, the parties that will be involved. Do you believe the inspector general should be involved in this inquiry? The department science integrity policy and the services procedures don't have a role for the inspector general in these sorts of things. This is part of our management structure within the, the Department and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Will the final report be made public? The report will be provided to the science integrity officers of the, the two bureaus, and they will determine whether there's any basis for any sort of action. If there is an action, um, it would be uh, a conduct issue, and it would be the, the personnel and human resources policies of the agencies that would be brought into play. Um, and that would be the, the basis of determining whether that report would be made public. Well, I hope it is made public. Have you all seen um, 
judges in utilize their own political philosophy and bend in trying in in making decisions on ESA determinations. There are many different um, judges and many different opinions, and I'm not um, one that um, spends much time trying to, to analyze the, any philosophy behind those, those rules. So well, I think we've seen in many instances where judges have used their own political philosophies a bent to affect how they judge things and not entirely independent, and I wonder in this case whether that might be so. Dr. Wilkins, the Endangered Species Act requires listing determinations to be made purely based on best available science. Are policy decisions ever made while conducting science? And do scientists make choices and decisions in the course of their work? That's a, that's a great question. Um, there's, and there's a lot of nuances there. So I'm in the business of training scientists. And that means we teach them to think. Uh, in, in addition to research methodologies and statistical methods and interpretations of scientific data, we teach them how to test policy, how to develop policy innovations, how to determine the implications of policy. So there are policy questions and there, and there are policy implications that intentionally become part of scientific, scientific work. Um, I think that's appropriate, and it's, it's mostly appropriate because that's the only way to know the difference between uh, objectivity and when you're using a particular policy preference to shade or distort your scientific findings. And so um, that, that ends up being the only way to maintain objectivity and integrity, I believe, is to know the difference and to know the difference of when you are presenting science versus when you are presenting uh, policy implications. Um, we just simply need to ask questions in such a way as to best inform management through our science, and management is a form of policy. Thank you, Dr. Wilkins. My time's expired. I now recognize Ms. Edwards for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, thank you to the witnesses. Uh, Dr. Griffo, I'd like to turn to you. Um, I wonder if you have some assessment of um, during Mr. Manson's tenure at the Interior Department. Um, that one of the most e egregious examples of politicization of science occurred. Could you provide the committee a thumbnail account of what happened during his tenure and in the years immediately after he left service in 2005? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, there were many, many, many species that were interfered with. Um, I think what was going on was the uh, modus operandi, if you'll forgive that expression, was really, there were three things, and it was really uh, Ms. McDonald who was at the core of these issues. She consistently called field biologists in the field, um, used foul language, bullied them, was incredibly abusive. You don't have to believe me, it's in the IG report. That was one thing. I think the second was that she sent internal Department of the Interior documents out to various places, to an online gaming friend and to the Farm Bureau in California and other places. But the third, which I think is the most incredible, is that she changed scientific results. If we look at Gunnison's sage grouse, Gunnison's prairie dog, white-tailed prairie dog, round-tailed chub, bull trout, marbled murrelet, Arizona bald eagle, Taberna Montana, Delta smelt, I could go on and on. It's a very long list. But what I find the most remarkable are the times that she did it in track changes in a Word document. And we were able to obtain through FOIA requests and other means those documents with her changes that were clearly, you know, scientific edits in those documents. So I don't know how much more, but I could obviously talk for a while. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dr. Griffo. And I just wonder if you know how many ESA listings had to be withdrawn in the wake of the IG's finding on Ms. McDonald's misconduct. There were investigations into a number of species. Um, you know, some were revised, but not all. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Frazier, I wonder if you can add any insight into how much work had to be redone at Interior after Mrs. Uh, Ms. McDonald resigned? Um, at the request <coughs> of the, the Deputy Secretary at the time, the service reviewed determinations that had been made and concluded that there were eight listing determinations, either petition findings or listing determinations or critical habitat designations um, that um, warranted revisiting. And the service 
um, revisited all of those and, and um, revised those, those determinations. There were other cases in which um, there have been merit challenges that were um, filed and we either um, lost those cases or we determined that we didn't have a, a defense and had to take them back and, um, and redo those. And I don't have a comprehensive list of all those right now. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Frazier. And now I'd like to ter turn to Judge Manson. I noticed in your opening uh, statement that you actually challenged the integrity of the IG, um, which um, strikes me um, because if that's a you know if that's in question, then uh, I think we have some other questions. But I'd like to know whether the actions uh, that you supported ended up costing the government a significant amount of money and having to redo studies and legal findings due to Ms. McDonald's direct interference. She was your, um, your employee. First of all, I did not challenge the integrity of the IG. I meant to challenge the integrity of those who brought into question some of those activities during, uh, during the time that I was there and the time that I uh, subsequently was a law professor for four years. But Judge, Judge Manson, you're aware of the rework that had to be done um, at the, it, within the department because of, of, of because, let me finish, because of uh, Ms. McDonald's conduct. And it's estimated that it may have cost at least hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's taxpayer money that that cost. Do you have a disagreement with that estimate? Um, is it too low? Is it too high? Is it just about right? Can you put a price on what that mismanagement under your tenure costs the American taxpayer? I have no way of putting a price on something that I don't regard as mismanagement. Well, the, the IG, I mean, whether you regard it that, that way or not, I mean, the Inspector General certainly regarded it as mismanagement enough to question the, the integrity of uh, dozens and dozens of, of, of scientific-based, what we thought was scientific-based research at, um, at the department. And so um, I would urge you, if you have some other estimate of that cost, that you would please submit it for our record, because we'd like to stack it up against the IG's conclusions. I've and with that, I'm, uh, my time's expired. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Uh, I now recognize Dr. Benichek for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Like all my other colleagues uh, in this room today, I routinely hold uh, town hall meetings uh, throughout my district. And uh, a few months ago, I was approached by one of my constituents as I left the town hall, and he was holding a very large garbage bag. I asked what a, if I'd like to take a look. This is Mr. John Kosky of Besmer, Michigan. And uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the bag held the carcass of a calf from his farm that had been killed by a gray wolf. And uh, you know, he confronted me with this picture as I came out of the, the town hall. It was pretty shocking. I'd like to submit a copy of this photo for the record. Unfortunately, farmers so are not the only con Pardon me? So ordered. Thank you. Unfortunately, farmers are not the only constituents with gray wolf problems. I have received letters from families whose family pets have been killed by wolves in their own backyard. Hunters in my district feel threatened by the wolf as they have no recourse against the animal. It worries me that many of my constituents feel that they can no longer enjoy the outdoors due to an out-of-whack wolf population. The most recent study completed by the Michigan DNR early this year indicated a minimum of 687 wolves in northern Michigan. The goal for recovery in Michigan was 200 wolves. The Fish and Wildlife Service, Michigan DNR, and my constituents all agree that the wolf should be delisted in Michigan. Uh, Mr. Fraser, can you speak to the science that impacted the service's decision to begin this process? Wolves were originally listed under the Endangered Species Act back in the, the 70s after they had been persecuted in the lower 48 states by elements of the former um, Fish and Wildlife Service um, at when times and societal values were, were different. At that point, wolves existed in the lower 48 only in um, northern Minnesota. We have, um, we believe, successfully recovered wolves. We have a proposal to, to delist wolves in the western Great Lakes. Out right now, we intend and expect to, to make a final determination 
um, on that by the, the end of this calendar year. We believe that wolves in the Western Great Lakes have recovered and it's appropriate to have them again managed as um, educated animals by the, by the states. Have there been any political issues that have impacted this process? No, sir. Uh, Mr. Frazier, would your agency ever consider giving a partial or a state waiver to the ESA? I'm not sure what you mean by a, a state Well, waiver. to allow the states to, to manage the population uh, without, I mean, at this point in time. Um, we work within the, the authorities we have under the Act, and there are certainly ways in which states um, can assume management lead for listed species in the northern Rocky Mountains. Uh, the states of Idaho and Montana um, had approved management plans for wolves that allowed them under our um, experimental population rules to essentially be the, um, the lead management agency and to, to administer the act. Uh, uh, Mr. Manson, the political fight over the Delta smelt has been wrapped up in um, environmental terms, but what about the impact of these rules on your users? I mean, how are California farmers and other water users impacted by the restrictions that have been contemplated? Well, the court found in 2009 that there were severe economic and social dislocations as a result of the application of the 2008 biological opinion. That included unemployment. It included <laughs> the loss of crops. It included uh, uh, even things that go so far as foreclosures of homes in the Central Valley. So the impact's been quite severe. And I'd like to say, with respect to Judge Wanger, uh, he, he is a neutral judge who has ruled against water users and ruled in favor of environmental interests at times and ruled in, against environmental interests at other times and in favor of water users. And I sat in the courtroom at each of the hearings at which the witnesses testified. And as a former litigator and a former judge myself, I was appalled at the testimony that was given. And I believe that his characterization of that testimony was correct. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back my time. Thank you, Dr. Benichek. I now recognize Mr. Miller for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The reason we have these hearings is to build a factual record for, uh, for conduct, for, for decisions before Congress, whether they be about legislation or about funding. Um, and uh, the, the chairman is correct in his opening statement. There can be uh, honest disagreements between uh, honest people, but uh, frequently the question uh, comes down to what to believe, and that comes down uh, to who to believe. Uh, so questions about the credibility of the people who testify before us is entirely proper, uh, just as, as it is in court. Um, I've raised questions before about the financial interests that have been undisclosed, uh, by witnesses at other hearings before this subcommittee and others. Um, there has been uh, vehement criticism of those questions by members of the majority. Uh, but we've just heard today in the, in the chairman's opening statement uh, questions about the, the credibility of environmentalists, of environmental group, because their income came in part from litigation that they pursued over uh, ESA uh, decisions. Um, uh, again, going to credibility of witnesses or credibility of scientists, uh, the chairman uh, questioned in his opening statement or quoted a, a, some, some district court judge in California I've never heard of uh, is saying that a scientist's testimony was the testimony of a zealot, um, that, the, uh, that the agency had acted in bad faith and attempted to mislead and deceive the court. I don't know anything about uh, that judge at all. Um, uh, the chairman's uh, testimony suggested that that must be the gospel truth if it was a, a judge saying it, but then he went on in questions and said that uh, judges use their own political philosophies uh, in, instead of, uh, of fact-finding. So uh, it, it, it appears that it is, I, I mean, I, I think we should properly consider the credibility of witnesses, uh, whether they have an interest. Uh, whether they, you know, that's not to say that everybody, anybody who uh, is consciously lying, uh, but uh, where we, uh, what our financial interests are has a tendency to color um, what we think, and that is something we should properly ask, and also instances of conduct. M Mr. Uh, Judge Manson, um, there have already been questions uh, about uh, the Inspector General's report. Um, I think, Mr. Chairman, that report should properly be part of the record today, and I would like to move it into evidence at the he of the hearings, part of the record. Without objection, so ordered. Um, Mr. Manson, uh, 
Ms. Griffo said that most of the conduct was by Julie McDonald. Um, the, the findings, not allegations, findings of the Inspector General are pretty striking that she did, in fact, consciously edit uh, uh, findings of the ES, of, about the ESA, under the ESA, that um, many were set aside, uh, two were set, apparently set aside by courts as arbitrary and capricious, um, and that uh, and th that she had improperly disclosed confidential information within the agency, outside of the agency, um, and on and on, and found that you had, n and when you were interviewed, there were no, you had no criticisms at all of her conduct. Do you still have no criticisms at all of her conduct? I have no criticisms of her conduct. W have you kept in touch with her? Do you, do you know what she's doing now? I do. What is she doing now? She's a consultant. And, and do you continue to have professional relationships with her? From time to time. Do, has she done any work for Westlands? She has. Okay. Has she done any work recently for Westlands? I don't know that. You're counsel for Westlands, right? Yes, but I'm. she doesn't do legal consulting. Okay. I don't know the last time she did anything specifically for Westlands. All right. Can you tell me what the Center for Environmental Science Advocacy and Reliability is? Yes, that is a nonprofit organization that I began while I was a law professor at uh, McGeorge School of Law. Okay. Are, and are you the executive director of that now? I am. Are you compensated for no, that? No, I'm not. You are, okay. You act entirely as a volunteer in that? Yes. All right. What is, what is the funding for, uh, for CSER? It comes from uh, donors of all sorts. And uh, as I understand the law, the, the donors' uh, lists uh, may remain confidential. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back my last 30 seconds. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Miller. The, uh, now I'll uh, yield the chairman of the whole committee, Mr. Ralph Hall. Chairman Hall, you recognize for five minutes. I will not use my five minutes. I want to inquire of Mr. Vincent Lang. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Services testimony mentions that the policy regarding the role of state agencies in Endangered Species Act uh, activities, unquote, uh, this policy recognizes that states possess broad trustee authority and over fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats within their border, as well as scientific data and valuable expertise on the stat status and the distribution of such species and habits. Uh, can you give us, tell us a little about your experience with this policy? Well, the policy, I think, is well-intentioned. Um, however, it's been implied. I don't know what I agree with you to start with, but well, go ahead. Well, I, th I think it is well-intentioned because it is trying to define a role of states into the ESA process. However, it's been applied very inconsistently. Our experience in Alaska is that we're being treated really no differently than any other um, stakeholder in the ESA decision processes. We find this kind of out of a compliance with the, with the policy. This said, there's an effort underway to reevaluate this policy, and we welcome this and look forward to having the value and roles of states recognized in the ESA processes and, and a formalized and consistent process for getting the state's management programs put into place. I might add the states are well positioned to manage currently healthy populations and the threats facing them. We have an excellent history in the tools necessary to manage species and the threats facing them under our jurisdictions. This ranges from sustainable harvest programs to habitat protections for th habitats that are under threat. In Alaska, we have an excellent history in our short 50-year statehood. No species have gone extinct underneath our trust responsibilities. I thank you. We read your testimony. I admired it, thought it was maybe my offhand remark to you to begin, and I'll have to withdraw that. I thank you. Uh, I have to withdraw a lot of things I say nowadays. Uh, Dr. Wilkins, your testimony indicates that the state efforts are more effective and less costly than one size fits all protections under ESA. I surely agree with that. Would you like to explain that for the record and what efforts are more effective and, and cost efficient? Certainly. It's good to see you, uh, Representative Hall. Um, we know that state agencies and, and state government, uh, at least in my experience and the experience of several others, has a set of, of science resources that simply 
aren't available um, to our federal agencies, not the least of which are the, are the research, extension, and outreach components of our state land grant university systems, our ability for state government to mobilize, mobilize forces and mobilize task forces. Uh, we saw an example of that in Texas just this last year. In fact, if uh, recovery goals were uh, optionally deferred to the states, I'm sure that uh, in many instances we would find state-level recovery plans that would be uh, scientifically reliable, science-based, and actually deliver greater performance on the act at a lesser cost than um, the way recovery plans are administered at present, sir. I thank you, sir, and I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, and thank you for having the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now recognize Mr. McNerney for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony this morning. Um, my first question goes to Honorable Manson. As you may know, I represent a large portion of the San Joaquin Delta, uh, which is the most important estuary on the West Coast. A healthy Delta supports jobs for thousands of farmers and fishermen, small businessmen. Uh, and last week I met with senior officials from the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, uh, which included a representative from the Westlands District. And I have to say what I heard uh, was absolutely unacceptable. Uh, I cannot accept a massive canal or tunnel uh, that would severely degrade the water uh, quality for the entire Delta. So in your opening statement, you mentioned uh, the constitutional rights, including property rights, uh, and, uh, and I, I believe that we all agree with that. So I have a simple question for you. Do you think it's okay to use people's lands to steal their water and destroy their livelihoods without their consent? Well, certainly not. But Thank you. I think the, the issue of the Bay Delta is one that is going to require a lot of cooperation from a lot of different entities. The water users are, have funded a great deal of the planning and the habitat conservation aspects of the uh, Bay Delta plan and have not engaged in stealing anyone's land or water. So then by building massive tunnels in the Delta uh, where people who live there are adamantly opposed and are not included in the discussion and have been excluded from the process, is that okay? And that's what's happened. Th those are the facts. Well, I, I can't speak to the larger Bay Delta process. There are many moving parts to it, and many of which we don't participate in. We're, we're looking for a stable, reliable water supply from the Delta. And uh, along with that, we have funded investigations, scientific investigations into uh, conservation efforts in the Bay Delta region. So you're looking for a stable water supply, uh, for example, a 15,000 uh, 15, CFS tunnel that would cause tens of millions of dollars in agricultural losses in the Delta. There is no specific plan at this time. That's one of the proposals, that's one of the proposals that has been uh, advocated by Westlands. And uh, do you think it's appropriate for the federal, state, and local agencies to sign agreements to fund the BDCP without any input from the Delta residents, which has happened? Well, I don't know that that's happened, but I will take your word for it. <laughs> okay, but thank you. Uh, my next question is for Gary Frazier. Um, the decline of the Delta ecosystem has important human implications, as you may know. Poor water quality is a severe threat to local farmers, and following record water diversions in the 2008 and 2009 periods, the California salmon fishery collapsed, costing thousands of jobs. The Central Valley Project Improvement Act required the interior to double wild salmon populations by 2002, but unfortunately we saw the opposite happen. Salmon declined. Doesn't the federal law require us to do more, not less, to protect the Delta ecosystem and the jobs that it supports? Congressman, I'm afraid that I'm not an expert on that particular authority and that program, I'd be very happy to get back to that specific question in, in, for the record. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Wilkins, I appreciated your thoughtful testimony, actually. Um, you're, you're actually proposing things that might make sense under scrutiny, I don't know yet. Uh, but you've been involved for a number of years with the projects at Fort Hood, Texas, which is a major Army installation. 
This program has been reported as having very, been very successful in protecting habitat for the golden cheek warblers, while also allowing flexibility to the Army to conduct the exercises they require. Yes, sir. I believe this is known uh, as, a as a recovery credit system. Can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing at Fort Hood? And is that a model that could be used in other locations? Yes, sir, I can. And uh, it, it is a model that, that could be used in other locations. The recovery credit system at Fort Hood was a proof of concept. Essentially, we demonstrated that we could get flexibility for training on a major defense installation um, through those actions that might, might disturb or take endangered species habitat on the installation. There was contracts that were let with private landowners who had habitat on their properties to maintain and enhance that habitat to more than offset any degradation to habitat that might occur on the defense installation. Therefore, there was a net benefit to recovery for that species in that exchange so that we had a, a, a better, better set of progress towards the recovery efforts. On private lands with private ranchers in Central Texas, which 20 years ago would have been unheard of, sir. All right, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McNerney. The chair now recognizes Ms. Adams for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Fraser, in the view of the administration, does the USFWS consider state-run wildlife management plans an important component of the ESA and species recovery? We do. Um, we view the state fish and wildlife agencies as special partners um, in endangered species conservation. While before species are listed, they are the agencies that in almost all cases have the management authority, fish, wildlife, and plants. We recognize this partnership as so important that under um, the leadership of former Director Sam Hamilton, current Director Dan Ash, we're participating in a specific task force, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fishery Service, and state fish and wildlife agencies to, to grow and strengthen the collaborative partnership. And that can certainly include um, working together on recovery planning, and more importantly, on conservation of species before they actually decline to the point so um, where they need to be listed. So it is an important component. Very important. If a state specifically incorporates hunting as a part of their management plan, what is the administration's position on the use of hunting as a management tool for species recovery? The Act lays out a very um, narrow exception for the use or for the allowance of regulated taking than the concept of conservation. So to the extent that we have had case law on application of hunting or trapping programs, it has um, um, not one that gives us a whole lot of latitude, but it is um, something we continue to explore in appropriate circumstances. Can you please provide what scientific criteria USFWS uses to determine the likelihood of a species being at risk of extinction over a 50-year period or a 300-year period? You know, please provide the specific criteria to justify such lengthy timelines. Do you have that with you? We don't have specific criteria. Can you criteria? provide that? You are referring, I believe, to what and how we determine what is foreseeable future in determining whether a species is a threatened species. Do you have specific criteria for that? No, we do not. So how do you determine? On the basis of the best available scientific information at the time of the listing determination. Mr. Chair, I would like to have them, for the record, bring forth that kind of information to the committee. Ms. Adams, we're going to allow them to ask, answer any written questions or ask them to answer any written questions. So um, you should be able to get that information. Okay. All right, we certainly lay that out in detail every time we um, interpret that phrase in the context of a listing determination. So we can So it's different for uh, each time as you go along? It is. Okay. USFWS recently settled lawsuits with litigants, wild earth guardians, and centers for biological diversity to make decisions on hundreds of species within an agreed upon timeline. Can you please explain how this settlement comports with the ESE as written, given that it appears to remove any opportunity for public input or comment, including that of outside scientists and experts in the study of species under consideration? The, the settlement simply resolved outstanding deadline litigation that was facing the, the service. We were not meeting the deadlines that were laid out in the act. So does it does it stop, because it appears to, stop any input from uh, the public 
Any comments from the public? Absolutely not. Experts? As I said in my, in my written statement, we will be making listing determinations through the rulemaking process with um, public notice and comment on all of our proposals, independent peer review. Um, it will go through the, the standard process that has extensive opportunity for public engagement. Well, in two settlements recently in Alaska, the USFWS agreed to dates after which the service will no longer be able to consider certain species to, in Alaska to be candidate species. Were the state of Alaska and its wildlife biologists consulted in the decision on how to prioritize these species for these settlements imposed de deadlines? I'm not, I don't know what circumstances you're referring to. Okay, well, we'll have to submit that so you can give us the answer. We'd be happy to, that. to respond for the record. Because I'd like to know if the state was considered. You state in your testimony that we are facing an extinction, extinction crisis. Yet later on in your testimony, you say that ESA is a success because, quote, relatively few observed extinctions have occurred in the United States during the last four decades, end quote. If that is the case, where is the crisis you are talking about? The Endangered Species Act was set up as a safety net. Um, we extend the provisions of the, the act to I'm asking where the crisis is. It's on the, the number of species that are at risk of um, being lost from our nation's biodiversity. Would you not agree that your statements kind of contradict each other? I don't believe that they, they do contradict. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Tonko for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Um, welcome to our panelists. I uh, appreciate your input. Um, I have here a, an Anchorage Daily News article from May 25th of, uh, I believe, 2008, titled, Email Reveals State Dispute Over Polar Bear Listing. Uh, and I ask that it be made part of the record, Mr. Chair. Without objection, so order. Thank you. The article reports allegations that state scientists uh, were not all in agreement over then Governor Palin's decision to have the state oppose listing the, uh, the polar bear as endangered. Uh, this story is interesting to me because of a, uh, a new policy of your new governor, Governor Parnell. That policy states, and I quote, once a department position or policy is established, employees must present, must present or adhere to such a position or policy when representing the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, whether directly or through use of its affiliation uh, or resources. In plain English, this indicates that once the state denies that a species is endangered, as the state has with the polar bear and beluga whale, state employees, including scientists, cannot be involved in any program or study that is built on an assumption that they are endangered. All a scientist can do, in my opinion, is repeat the state's position, regardless of facts. I would like to enter, Mr. Chair, an Anchorage Daily News article from June 6th of this year uh, on this policy uh, at this point in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, this policy has had immediate consequences. The National uh, Marine Fisheries Service, NIMFS, has removed two Alaska state scientists from the Cook Inlet Beluga Whale Recovery Team because the state policy directly conflicts with the purpose of the scientific panel. Now, Mr. Vincent Lang, you have been quoted in the Alaska press as supporting this new policy. Is that accurate? Do you support this policy? Through the chair, um, Mr. Tonga. Um, yes, I do support the policy. I think the policy is meant to encourage frank and open discussion regarding how the state position is set up. But once we have that state position defined, I think it's our responsibility then as an agency to have a single position so that the public isn't confused about that position and we're clearly articulating it. But Nothing in that policy, though, prohibits an honest and open debate about what, how we're going to reach a position. But it could lead to non-scientists making that policy uh, where <laughs> 
there was suggestion that uh, that there was not uh, there wasn't scientific support for some of the administrative decisions. Well, as, as you can probably understand, even in your own staff, there's probably a wide range of views on any single issue. I think it is the responsibility of the of the leadership of the department to take all those divergent views and come up with a single position that best reflects our agency's position. And we did that. And in the case of the polar bear article, there was a single individual that had a different perspective than 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 the entire leadership of the department. Mm -hmm. In the case of the cook and the beluga whale. We asked our biologists to simply represent those views when they were participating in the recovery panel. And we offered them the opportunity, if they didn't want to do that, to, to participate in that panel on their own, separate from the department. Now, Mr. Vincent Lang, given that the policy requires state employees to articulate no position but the state's position, could you even tell us here today, under oath, if you disagreed with that policy without potentially facing employment consequences back home? If I disagree with that policy, mm -hmm. I, well, I don't. I agree with the policy. So, <laughs> Dr. Griffo, you've been following scientific integrity issues for many years um, and head up UCS's project on this subject. Do you have any comment that you would share with this panel um, as to that you would want to make about the, the state of Alaska's policy regarding its state scientists on scientific panels. Yes, thank you. I mean, I find this policy to be extremely troubling. Um, I'm not aware that when you become a scientist and gain state employment that you give up your First Amendment rights. I mean, I think the federal government and the scientific integrity policies and the communication policies that we are working on within those call for a personal views exception, where a scientist may stand up and be very clear that they are now expressing their own personal view and not the view of the agency. I also believe that it's incredibly important in these conversations to capture dissenting opinions. Everyone isn't going to agree, and I think sometimes we think, oh, that confuses the public and it's hard. But I think it's okay to have those dissenting opinions represented in the record. Mm -hmm. You know, with dissenting opinions... Uh, Gentlemen, time has expired. Okay. Um, I thank the witnesses for y'all's valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the sub subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and you can ask those, and Ms. Adams can too. And we ask all of you to please respond to those in writing. The record will, will remain open for two weeks for additional comments from members. The witnesses are excused and the hearing is now adjourned. And thank you all.